So, Landon, uh, just a quick introduction for those of you who are just joining us. Um, I'm here with Blandon. Um, Blandon and I have known each other for a little while now. I've seen him in investment groups. And of course, then he started out um, not only mortgage broking, but his own company. And uh, that's now gone through a refresh as Mortgage HQ, although you may have known them at IRFI. These guys would have to be some of the most knowledgeable and creative um, guys in the space as far as helping investors grow their portfolio. Uh, I love the way that they look, not just at the environment, but also at the person and what they're trying to accomplish so depending on whether you're a mum and dad or if you're a young guy trying to get ahead whatever your situation is a um, bit of a sting for them but it's all true they've certainly helped me so i really appreciate it and uh blandon mate thanks so much for joining us talk to me this is a huge situation that's unfolding where the handbrake's been pulled on massively for business right across the board um, but at the same token interest rates have just plunged and they're already low um, what does this all mean uh there's a yeah certainly I, I I agree and yeah thank you for that introduction. Uh, there's there's uh, a lot happening right now. I mean in the immediate short term, what we're seeing as for clients is you know just trying to manage their cash flow. Cash flow is really important right now. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, job on on hold at the moment. Um, you can see that uh, people unemployment rate. Obviously, it's, it's not a, there was a statistic, actually, I'm, I'm just going to pull that up from, um, yeah, I mean, the statistics for job cl jobless claims is all time high, you know, higher than mm. 2008. So immediately, a lot of people are- Is that just because the government's basically gone out there and said, hey, if you're affected by this, put in your claim? Or is it actually because it's the reality? I, I, I do believe it's a reality. I mean, you can read the news like- uh, Air New Zealand is slashing 3,000 jobs, more than 3,000 jobs, and their shares has plummeted below one dollar. You know, um, some of the uh, even big bank shares have have dropped one third. So there is a lot of uncertainty, and I, I think um, immediately there are a lot of people trying to fix their cash flow position. You know, trying to lower their their mortgage repayments, lower their leases. Um, some some are on pause. Um, so yeah. when you talk about fixing the cash flow situation, and you mentioned this just before about how cash flow is so important at the moment, um, what are some of the clever ways that you're seeing your clients do this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, immediately you can you can uh, ask the bank for interest only. Interest only is a, uh, has been a lot more lenient with the bank in the past week. They have, you know, when, when the government announced, hey, we're going to do this mortgage holiday thing, uh, the banks, you know, haven't figured out how they're going to manage that because obviously it's mm -hmm. a it's a lot of logistics they have to sort out processes so this this week i think it's a lot more clarity on how they manage it you know different banks are handling it differently most of them if it's a mortgage holiday they're directing the client uh, to the bank uh, through through the helpline um, and then they can what mortgage holiday is basically is essentially asking the bank to lend you some money um, to pay for your mortgage for the next six months. So it's not, it's, essentially, it's not a holiday. You, you're going to pay for it in the future. You're just kicking the can down the road. Yes, exactly. But um, if you're not in a position to wear it right now, that's still a better alternative than going into default, right? Yeah, and, and I think if, if these clients are able to refix on their current interest rate 3%, the mortgage holiday is, is not too bad. It's not too bad of an option if, uh, you know, if you're feeling that financial hardship. Um, a lot of people, a lot of companies are at 80% capacity. Um, and then if, if they can't get the mortgage holiday, you know, the next best thing is the interest only or extending their loan term. Cause a lot of people like to increase their repayments, you know, just to pay down their mortgage a bit faster. But now is the time to just sort of do a restructure back to 30 years. But obviously there are different options and it's, it's best to talk to somebody that is um, sort of specializing in that field. And, and that's what M uh, Mortgage HQ do. And some of our advisors can sort of help help with that. Yeah, so so I think medium term, you're going to see a lot of, um, I, th I think industries are going to need to adapt, right? Like you're going to see that, okay, now these uh, businesses are sort of scared. You know, if this happens again, how are we going to handle it? Um, they're going to, I think I think there's going to be a lot of industry shift seeing like okay let's let's look at our fixed costs how could we lower the fixed costs 
businesses need to adjust. They're going to get these overdrafts from a bank. It's government backed. Um, not not too much info is out there at the moment, but um, they're going to have this 200,000 line of credit. Um, and then they're going to try and figure out, okay, well, what's next? Uh, like, like for ourselves as well, we, we like immediately as, as uh, lockdown got announced, Andrew and I are catching up uh, on a daily trying to figure out, okay, what, what can we slash on, on cash flow? How do we, how do we lower our fixed costs, fixed expense as a business? Um, what are the necessities? Uh, and then, uh, you know, how do we adapt to that in the future, you know, to face this um, situation? Again? Like how do we become resilient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an important part to talk about the resilience piece and not just what we do right now, but also how you can go through this, continue to operate and be in a good position out the other side of it, because we don't know how long it's going to take. But one thing's for certain, eventually this will pass. Um, and it, it seems like you're basically batting down the hatches at the moment from the sense that you're predicting a low volume of, of new loans and refixes. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good question, right? And I like my truly believe there are transactions in every market. There are transactions in yeah. every market, um, and you have to be able to adapt in those markets because right now, like, what transactions am I seeing? Uh, well, I, I talked to the first home buyers. Too much uncertainty. They they don't know. They don't. They're too scared to buy. They they don't know what's happening going to be with the prices. Because what what the are there price to rule? About? Sorry. Are there exceptions to that rule? Uh, yes, there are. There are some first home buyers still, but I I would say the the majority of the volume of first home buyers that are interested, uh, you know, they're holding back right now because sure. the first home buyers the the, the most the biggest worry for them is. is overpaying for something mm. they don't know what's happening with the market they don't know they, they don't know what they don't know yeah. and so first home buyers are definitely uh sort of held back the transactions that i'm doing are investors and and uh very business or a very busy business owners getting a bit more time at, on their hand being able to like okay like look at their position is there some restructure that we need to do now to you know weather the storm in the future um, and, and so there, there are some businesses looking at, okay, like it's, it's time for me to look at a big restructure on, on, on the debt. How do we lower the repayments? How do we set it up for the next five years? And, and it's, it's a good time for that. So it's just trying to figure out where the market is heading, where the transactions, and then uh, just being able to get in front of those. Mm, well, it seems quite interesting. So I've been watching some of the international real estate markets to try and see, um, it, of course, there's no guarantee that New Zealand's going to go exactly the same way. It's going to be different in each place. But I think you can still make a better educated guess looking at how other markets have responded. So if we look firstly at China, because that's obviously where things were first impacted, uh, their real estate markets in terms of volume massively contracted like everything went on hold now i'm not sure how much of that is directly related to the exact rules of their lockdown but it certainly seems that the volume of transactions just dropped away massively and i think we're probably going to see the same thing here there will still be deals done i'm sure um, but they will probably be the exception rather than the rule in terms of actual unconditional settled sales um, just the simple move out rules prevent a lot of that being even possible um, but I, I wonder if what we are going to see is a big bounce back because that has happened. So looking at maybe the eight largest metropolitan, se uh, metropolitan centers in China um, post, well, it's not even post, it's just sort of coming out of their really restricted period. They've all bounced back with levels of activity which are higher than that last quarter in 2019. So I'm wondering if the opportunity here, like I, I, I Maybe first home buyers are too risk averse, but I'm kind of going like Warren Buffett. You know that that guy says, you know, when everyone's greedy, be fearful. When everyone's fearful, be greedy. Um, and certainly, if you were a first home buyer or even an investor, and you've, you're going along and you're seeing auctions, you know, the market in the 2019 had really started to pick up again here in New Zealand, especially in Auckland. And so, but even in the regions, and like I sold a house and we had 12 offers on it in Palmerston North. We had 12 offers on the property. I mean, if you're in that situation and you're just getting beaten out time and time again in a competitive scenario well now's the time to buy a property in isolation <laughs> and if you're trying to time the market that seems like yeah maybe maybe who knows you know the outlook is not looking super rosy this is something that's going to be affecting for a little while 
but I think if you can buy well, in other words, like a property that actually meets the criteria that you've got set, you know, it's in a great location, there's an opportunity for a twist. Uh, it's got great cash flow. I mean, if you can buy a property and it increases your ability to borrow out the other side of it, I mean, that seems like a no brainer to me. But, but do you see opportunities here for, for people? Yeah, I mean, definitely, like, uh, we're sort of like talking uh, micro and macro. So micro wise, I think as a uh, look, I, I don't consider us a massive business that, you know, if the economic shift by 1%, like our business is, is not like in a great danger. So I, I think a lot of you have mortgage business, HQ or sorry, mortgage HQ. Yeah. Yeah. So, so trying to on a micro level is trying to figure out, okay, where are the transactions and how do we get in front of those? But on a macro level, I think overall volume, like you're right, it's going to, it's going to look more like what's happening uh, in the Chinese real estate market. You know, it's going to, in the immediate short term, people are going to put everything on a halt. Uh, but obviously there are those opportunity seekers and yeah, at the, at the end of the day, what are investors looking for? They're looking at specific numbers. They're looking for um, the fundamentals. You know, we're talking about Warren Buffett. What does he look for? He looks for fundamental. What, what is the product? Is there, is there a competitive advantage in the market? You know, is there um, brand insistency on, on this brand? Like, even though, um, you know, we are slowing down as an economy um, for, for the near future, you know, the, the, does, do people still want to drink Coke? You know, like, those are the questions um, you could ask. And I think- with How does it apply to property from your perspective? How does it apply in property? So yeah, like, it's a good question, right? Like, so like, like, you, like you mentioned, location, um, and then being able to measure cash flow as an investor, uh, being able to go, okay, well, uh, what have we seen in the past? You know, like we we got history to look at, and you look at the average return in Auckland market. It's if you if you look at fifty years, it's seven percent, right? Like it's it's sort of closer, uh, give or take seven percent. So then you go, okay, well, oh, like if if I map out everything, um, am I am I able to get this, you know, below below the market value? And then I think another major thing that you have to look at is uh, the QE quantitative quantitative easing so basically yeah, the basically bank is money right printing money right like if 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 the reserve bank and the and the federal reserve is is printing money what does that mean the, the dollar value is gonna is gonna decrease it's not worth as much anymore um what are what are the assets that are scarce you know like and money's not worth it, uh, as much anymore you look at the past history uh, with the three QEs that the Americans did, what it did for asset price was massive. You know, the, the asset. Well, price, when you say massive, what are we talking about here? And maybe if we stick to the specific asset class of property, what ha what's happened there? Yeah, I, I, the figures don't quote me, but um, you know, based on uh, the QE, I, I remember it was a period of like six years, like two two years. Is, it was almost like ten percent the the uh, mortgage back assets. Um, you can just Google this, right? Like, and, and so you can, if you look on a graph immediately after QE, there's a spike in, in asset growth. Um, and, and I think- But so what you're saying here is that when money is created out of nothing, asset values go up. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, because, you know, what assets are scarce, like there's limited resource, finite resource for land. Uh, but you, I guess the other spectrum you got to look at, yes, the asset price is going to be worth more uh, because there's money's worth less. Um, you know, going to the fundamentals like, you know, Matthew Gilligan always preaching about population growth and economic growth. And I think those are two, two other pillars, two to three. Um, so, yeah, being able to gauge on, okay, what's going to be happening with population growth? Is New Zealand still a desirable place for people to immigrate to? And the truth is, yeah, it is. Right? Like, it's Surely a, it's, a, it's only going to become more desirable after this. Exactly. It's a, it's you can a, look at New Zealand on the world stage as far as our leadership. Yeah, like, we, we're going to make what you think of the policies, Jacinda yeah. comes across beautifully. She communicates so well. Her empathy and the way she communicates is, you know, being applauded, not just in situations like the Christchurch massacre, but even in the response to COVID-19. And in her um, right-hand band in the old, uh, what's her name, Ashley Bloomfield. 
that guy he speaks so well you know like people have been going in other countries going man if only our leadership looked like this so you look at the political aspect and then you just look at the natural environment i mean anyway we're fanboys for new zealand it's a great place I'm yeah 100 sure. percent. We'll, we'll make the prediction that more people are going to move here right eh? 100 go up. i think the only thing that will restrict that is the policy we just talked about the great leadership but the policy on that side has been to try and restrict that flow um but yeah. i'm sure it's not to cut it off entirely um but so, yeah. I, I, I like i like the new policies you know they they're making it so that hey look we're we're getting more skilled migrants and that, that's that's an important thing like to like we're getting a lot of brain drain like i mean do you probably know if we ask everybody um, if they have been here for 10 years, how many of their good friends moved away to Canada? Oh, huge. So many of my China, friends. China, Australia, right? Yeah. Like your your best mates, the, the ones that are like really, really smart, they, they moved. Yeah. So and what does that say about us? A lot of them, though, here? A lot of them know that the intention is still to return, you know? Yeah. And in fact, well, the funny thing with this scenario is a lot of them have returned. So it'll be interesting to see how that progresses. You know, I, th I, I feel like we're going to see a spike in the return of those people, especially if they lose jobs internationally. Well, it's a lot easier to come home to mum and dad and their support network in New Zealand than to try and tough it out. Yeah, no, de definitely. I mean, I, I do see, yeah, like a few few really good mates, you know, got their OE done and they come, they come back um, stronger and, you know, they've got good earning powers so that, you know, they, they can invest in property. So, yeah, yeah so I think that we're going to see that as a trend. You mentioned like super macro here about the QE and the quantitative easing, plenty of money. Uh, as, as a result, you notice a climb in asset values. Um, the other thing that, to my mind, the most basic market principle as far as asset values go is supply and demand. Um, but I've always watched in real estate, when you see the market, when you see volumes contract, that's the first thing that happens. Like volume starts to contract when there's downward press, pressure on price because people hate to lose money. Like they, they hate losing money twice as much as they like making money. But the reality is, is that people are a little bit irrational. So what they do is there's a climbing ratchet and wherever they believe the value of their property was, that's where they actually see the value. They forget that they bought it 20 years ago or six years ago or whatever. And they go, oh yeah, but it was worth 1 million last year and so now that I, i'd like to sell it but the best offer i've got on the table is 900 i'm losing a, i'm losing 100 grand but actually um whilst that's a bit of a misnomer it's still people hate the idea of that and so you see volume start to contract but i, I mean i'm i, I really do, it's hard to predict what will happen here but the volume that we're going to see contract over this period of lockdown i think is a bit of an artificial um, it's really more of a press pause rather than the actual market trend, just because there is such a, a, a both mental and logistical barrier to that to, to the transactions. But it'll be fascinating to see what comes out the other side. I, my pick is that we're going to see a bit of pent up activity, but then as people who are either in difficulty or perceive they're going to be getting into difficulty start to take action and perhaps decide to cut their losses, who knows? There's, I'm sure there's going to be good opportunities there. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like I, I, I totally agree with like the short term. There's, there's going to be a lot of people sort of holding back. Um, and traditionally, if you look at the economy, uh, it's based on transactions. Or another word, Andrew always talks about it is the velocity of money. You know how mm. how quickly are money changing hands? And um, traditionally, like fun, I'm not I'm no econo economist, but um, the basics of it is hey, no normally business credit is the first to be at ease. If, if business credit becomes at ease, business is able to- like At ease. Uh, so Sorry, uh, what I mean is it's, it's easier for them to get lending. Mm. When businesses, business credit is uh, easily yeah. accessible, uh, then it's easier for people to take that risk. They go, okay, it's, it's, not, it's not that big of a risk. Let's try so this. Rewind two months, rewind two months. How easy was it for businesses to get credit? Well, actually, if you look at in the few, like last six months, I would say um, there, there were more, lend like last 12 months, there were more lenders coming on the market. You know, we're getting like emails from short-term lenders saying, hey, look, we, we're, trying to, we're trying to give out more um, business credit. Um, but like closer to like recent, I, I definitely feel like it was, it was definitely harder. There were they were holding back. I mean, and was this tightening because of the developing situation or related to something else? That that's that would be 
I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have um, a, sure. a good insight on that. Um, but I, I definitely feel like well, what's you know, the situation right now, aside from the you know like the government's assistance of some finance here, how easy is it for a business to get credit right now? I think like immediate it's going to be it's going to be tough but like once the government goes hey look we're going to back up 80 percent of this um i think the tap is going to be turned back on like right now yeah even a top up is really hard like a 20 30 top up clients saying hey i want to talk about a residential mortgage yeah even residential is, is tough right now um you know i talked to i talked to my mate i won't i won't say which bank but um normally we send some business finance there you know, they're just like, hey, we're just going to hold back right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the second tiers, you know, sent out an email straight away immediately after the lockdown. Hey, we're not we're not looking at any construction loans. Um, so so there's a halt in finance. They, they're not too sure because they don't want to promise saying, hey, look, we're going to lend you X amount. Um, and then, you know, we don't even know what's going to happen with the economy. So immediately there's there's a lot of a lot of uh, holdbacks. What about and, existing um I don't know what the correct word is, pre-approvals, right? Existing pre-approvals for, for your clients. Um, is there a bit of a sense of urgency with those who have a pre-approval that's out there at the moment to try and snap something up or are they just going, oh, who cares? If I can't get it again, I won't worry. Completely honest. Like like I mentioned before, I think the first home buyer market, you know, there's, there's a big... What about, what about the other market or the other markets as well? Yeah, big percentage of the first home buyer probably dropped off, but the there's a good portion of the investors where, you know, they have they have built up good equity. They have, you know, just not over leverage in the in the past market where they pick up properties with good cash flow, you know, who who have been sustained. Uh, you know, they they thought about the investment strategy from the beginning. Like those people are, it like they have a massive advantage in this current market. You know, they've got people were scared like like warren buffett said you know they're, they're the ones that are able to go hey yeah i've, I've just found this property six and a half percent i'm about to do a wellington home and income six and a half percent cash flow um this is before renovations you know like the last time that we did this trend this um transaction for this client she renovated and she was at closer to eight percent cash yeah. flow you know? like if you're able to finance that at what to give us a quick update what's the best interest rate you can get at the moment <laughs> uh yeah it's 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 um let's say you're banks, in a good position the banks, the banks don't like this but um <laughs> what, what what we can say uh to you publicly is is the is the special rates is the special rates you know we'll, we'll try push harder for you depending on the scenario but um yeah whatever so the don't, banks so don't name a bank don't name a bank don't put anyone in it but we want to know, like, what, what feasibly, you know, you've you've managed to secure this. What's what's the best rate? Look, we we've seen below three, but um, like as as, set, as expectation that uh, rates are still sitting at around three point zero five. I still yeah. I still think there's a bit of margin there for the banks. Obviously, you know, the floating rate they um they they gave a uh, almost um they gave almost a full discount on the floating rate, but the fixed rate is kind of not there just yet. Yeah, so yeah. there might be further drops that I expect in the, in the near future. Gotcha. So your, your short-term outlook is that rates will crawl even lower, especially the fixed. Yeah. I think once they figure out like, okay, like this is what's happening. Lockdown is finished. Um, then they're probably more comfortable to give out those margins. Cause right now it's like, there's no new lending. All of the applications that they're doing is just putting people on interest only. Uh, it does, I guess the banks are still banking on future revenue by doing that. Obviously, interest only, uh, extending loan term and mortgage holiday, it's all generating future revenue, but immediately it's going to be tough. Gotcha. Yeah, so their cash flow is also impacted through that. Yeah, and, and yeah, at, at, the, at the end of the day, like I totally understand when people say, hey, you know, the banks are holding out you know but a lot of our friends work in the banks you know their families right they they're still still giving out a lot of jobs so um as a business they still got to be like looking after themselves so yeah it's it's yeah kind of regardless expensive. of what you think of the banking sector they do fulfill a pretty important role and the last thing we would want to see is the banks go belly up yeah 100 percent. 
Yeah. What are what are you doing in this current market, David? Like I I think I uh, had an inquiry by by David uh, Pal Freeman the other day about <laughs> like um, yeah I mean we'll put Airbnb. it <laughs> pardon me uh, extending a Airbnb portfolio I think yeah oh mate I I my own experience in property investment is that I'm not particularly good at timing the market so I wouldn't take advice on trying to time the market from me but from my experience is that actually as long as you don't have to time the market in other words like as, as long as you're buying a good property that actually achieves the needs you want then it doesn't matter if it drops a little way in value and it, then it comes, it grows again. I mean, ideally, I'd rather not sell property. I'd rather just keep buying it. Um, and I'm lucky that um, actually if, if um, in the position that I'm at, where if I'm able to purchase again, I will. So yeah, that's why I'm talking to you about it. I'm just like, right, let's see if, we, if there's a way to make it happen. But um, I guess, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thinking that I have towards buying and the advice that i give someone is that if they have the capacity to purchase at the moment then you've actually got an opportunity where there's not a huge amount of other people doing it that you can make something happen so i've seen some deals that have been secured through so my clients real estate sales people and business owners right uh, and salespeople through this time are either largely i'm sure there's lots of different places but they're either in one or two modes they're going oh thank god for the lockdown you know like i'm actually going to enjoy a little bit of a holiday um or they're going right how do i make sure that my business is in a really good position to experience the the growth out the other side of this mm -hmm. and it's slightly different for a salesperson because their income isn't about the value of the house Sure, they make a little bit more money if the property prices are higher than if they're lower, but it's actually about turnover. So this is going to be a really tough little period while we're in lockdown and it's difficult to transact. But the pent up activity and the transactions, as long as they're in a position to actually bring people to the market and make sales, then they'll be away. Uh, so yeah, the volume of transactions is more of an interesting one to look at from a salesperson's lens. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, I think the secret to all of this is, you know, my perspective on buying is possibly different to your perspective on buying, but it might be that there's a bunch of other people who share your perspective or share my perspective. Uh, and it's, it's not so much about trying to shove my perspective down anyone's throat. It's rather just, well, you know, why, what's informing your perspective? Yes. And certainly, um, it, I, I think you and I have a similar role, or if I was to step into a salesperson scenario, you know, my, my job's not to try and make someone sell or make someone buy. It's just to, if I know someone who wants to buy, to really try and understand what's, you know, why are they doing that? What's, what is it that they're seeking to achieve through that purchase? And then when I understand their objectives, then I can actually help them to achieve those and I get paid. And it's the same thing with a seller. You know, if a, if a seller was to say to me today, oh, you know, like I was about to put my house on the market. I think I'm just going to wait. My question is, well, wh why were you putting it on the market? What, what was what was the impetus for that? Because the reality is if they were just going to be trying to actually, either, you know, they needed to get more space. Well, as long as they're transacting in the same market, it's actually irrelevant. But you can make and you can make and also you lose money when there is volatility. But that's where it comes. It becomes so important to have a quality person representing you in the sale. Um, and so I think there's, this, there's huge opportunities here, buyers and sellers, where there's the volatility to actually be really smart about either buying the right thing or making the right sale uh, and choosing the right people to represent you. And that's really important. Uh, and I think the same thing for the financing side of things. That's why I wanted to get your opinion because yeah. like I have a, a very one, you know, narrow lens perspective on it just for my own situation, but that's where I'm trying to go. Tell me about the other scenarios, you know, the, the investors who do have big portfolios, how are they approaching this or the people that are in the situation I just alluded to, you know, that are maybe looking at, they want to upsize their house or they want to downsize, or they're looking to just move through a different sector of the market and get into a slightly better location. Uh, what are they saying to you at the moment yeah 100 I, I think i think a lot of what you said is um is right like understanding the client's goals and objectives like okay why are you making this move and and that is that is what what we can do as a consultant as an advisor you know be, even if you're a real estate agent you are an advisor or consultant in some way and it's just trying to you know not not just take the transaction as it is but you know be able to ask the right questions for the, for your clients and and knowing that it's going to make it a lot easier 
um, to help them. And for us, is what are the right questions? The right question is okay. Like, why are you making this move? You know, right? Like, why are you making what? What? What are you trying to achieve with this? And what is the what is the bigger, longer, longer term objective? Let's not think five. Let's not think like immediate two, three years, but five, ten years. Like roughly, even like most people don't know, but roughly, where where are you guys heading? And I, I think by un understanding that first, if they question themselves first, then the decision now makes it a lot easier. You know, right? Like if if you want to stay lean and healthy for your kids in the next 10 years, you're going to watch the way you eat and how you exercise, right? It's okay. the same thing. And it's just the little things that you're doing now. And I think a lot of the time when, when clients talk to a real estate agent, uh, a lot more emotion, emotional um, decisions are made because, you know, they like they want certain things. And when they talk to an I, advisor, I've got an opinion on this emotional piece as well, but I'm curious on yours. Do, yeah. do investors behave emotionally? Uh, I, of course, you know, like, like, <laughs> are we are we talking about, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of investors, right? It's just like, what kind of investor? Like, people who have one or two property, they they still say they're investors, but um, you know, like, they might just have used the equity like a couple of times and um, just bought something based on the approval that they got from the banks. Um, and then, you know, they, they got a break even portfolio. Like, are they really investors? I, I, w I wouldn't like, yeah, just depending on your definition of investors. But what I'm trying, what I was trying to get at is like, when buyers come to us is um, I'm trying to show them the logical side and yes. what the real estate agent is like, Hey, you know, these are all the, all the things that you get. Let, let me show you the house as well. Let, 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 let you have a feel of what, what it's like. To, to be in this this house for us is like okay how does the numbers work and I think um, we, we're talking about two two school of um, buyers here so we've got the first home buyers I think more than ever it's going to be really important that um, they actually sit down logically put it on paper and go actually this is how much rent that we're paying with the new interest rate at three percent how much is it going to cost me even if I overpay what's the worst case can I still afford the mortgage even if I had to like move back home and I rented this out. What is the market rent? Uh, is, it, is that going to cover everything? So it's just trying to work through those actual like financial decisions with the client um, mm. to, to make them help them make a decision. So first home buyer, they're going to realize it's like, well, at 3% it's cheap as chips. It's going to be, it's going to be cheaper to buy than, than rent. And then for the investors, you know, they, as long as they are like the, the, the big portfolio people, what are they doing? Well, um, a lot of them are actually doing a restructure, like I like I mentioned. It, it makes sense right now. Like they're, they're when you say restructure, what are you meaning? Yeah, restructure. So good, good question, right? So restructure normally involves a few things. One is obviously lowering your interest rate. You might be breaking some of your interest rates, and the reason why you would do that is well, the break fee you can actually, according to the few accountants I work with, you can attach a certain amount of break fees onto your. Uh, investment property so there is a, a bit of a tax benefit because break fee what is break fee first first of all break fee is the break even point if you're if you're fixed on four percent and you break to a three percent obviously the bank is going to charge you the difference but as an investor there's a there's a hack and that is the 33 percent difference that you're getting it back in um, tax rebate now it's not tax rebate it's it's future tax that you're paying so right um and don't quote me on this. I'm a financial advisor, not an accountant, but <laughs> my accountant, you can, you know, you, you're getting that 33%. Although, although the bank is charging you this much and you're going to save this much, you, you, it's a break even exercise. But because there's future tax that you're saving, the breaking it's to fine. a low interest rate makes sense. Um, as well as, you know, the lawyer fee, if you were to switch banks, that, that is part of the, the cost. Um, and then also the fact that, you know, it, it makes sense. Don't don't try to look at interest like re-extending your interest only to five years when the five years is up. You know, do it when it's like three years down the track, right? Like you got to do it early because you don't know. You, you just never know. A, well, a lot what do you mean by that? Yeah, so 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 most investors might have uh, their properties on a five years interest only, and what that basically means is they they minimizing their cash flow and. Some people go, oh, why would I not pay off the principal? It doesn't mean that you don't pay off the principal just because you're lowering your repayments, paying the minimum. 
it, it still mean you can pay off the principal, but you're actually in more control because if you're on interest only and you're making cash flow positive on, on your property, you're making money by the end of the year with the profit, you can actually go, okay, you know what? Let me just, I'm making good profit. I'm going to pay a lump sum towards the mortgage. So you can still pay off your principal, but as an investor, you have- But in a more controlled way. Sorry? You can, st doing an interest only doesn't mean you can't pay back your principal. It just means you, have it, you can do it in a more controlled way. That's right. You're controlling your cash flow, and 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 so interest only. Normally, the banks are offering between two to five years if own occupied. Up to two years, it's harder to get uh, interest only on own occupied, but you can get up to five years. But it's based on servicing. So mm -hmm. what that basically means is, although in, in the in the buyer's mind, like interest only is a lower repayment, but the for but for the bank they use like a higher servicing um, capacity to, to actually uh, okay. measure how much you, if whether or not you can go on interest only. So you want to do that early where it's like, okay, three years down the track, um, you, your interest only still got two years left. You want to start looking at plans to extend it to five years instead of like on the five year mark. And then I've so got your message, your message to, um, anyone who's watching this who actually has loans that are fixed currently is look at your structure. There's an opportunity here for you to make a margin because interest rates are now lower. And if you've got loans that are coming up and they're, they're, they're still a couple of years away, it's still a better time to look at actually what you're going to do with those. But what is the objective of this? Like what a, I, I get the cash flow scenario and that there's a, a margin to be made where you're restructuring because of the tax efficiency. But if you put that piece aside, what are the other benefits? Yeah, like uh, look, the thing is, if you are only got two years left on the interest only instead of rushing when the two years up and then finding out that your income is down, which is what happens a lot of, with real estate, example like i've got a lot of real estate uh agent clients you know on a good year they're like yeah invincible right top top of the mountain right um and then five years is up it happens to be the year that they not doing so well or they they took a break it's really hard for them to to make the changes that they want so, so if you're in a good position financially now do it yep so yeah if you if you got the if you got the if you're in a good position you want to do it then you know some agents um, you know, when they when they're busy, they're too busy to do anything. Mm. So it's 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 an That's important great time. Yeah, TikTok of the <laughs> of your structure. Yeah, it's important just to have someone on your team that that you can just you know get that done right. And so that's that's the that's the message. Um, Another thing that you um, started to talk about, or we touched on a little bit, was the timing thing and like timing the market. Um, what does this remind you of? Like, I know it's unprecedented, but there's been other times that, you know, there's, there's been changes in the economy. Yeah, I, I think, um, are you talking about recession? or are you well, talking I, about actually, I, I felt like I was almost leading you with that because the reason I say it is because it reminds me of the GFC in some respects, but I, I'd rather not you tell me. Where were you in the... Where were you in the last GFC, David? Pardon me? Where were you in the last GFC? Oh, mate, I was um, Oz and Palmy, actually. And yeah, the market was hit hard. But when I say the market was hit hard, it was hit I hard. We, I thought we were at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> we were at the pub with our uni mates. <laughs> Holy shit, I yeah, can't I don't, I, I, Yeah, like I, I, I'll, I'd, I'd probably stay away from that just because I've, I've done my studies on the, on the GFC um, during university. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to give you like wisdom that to say, Hey, look, I've lived, lived through one. No, well, I, so I did, I was selling through the last recession. Oh, far out. Yeah. I was oh. selling through the recession. I started real estate you in started 2005. Working early. So 2008, 2009, I was going hard. Um, and it was actually a really stressful time because, um, up until that point, the market had been going really, really well. It was a boom market. Boom market. And as a salesperson, you feel like top of the world, like you talked about before. Um, and one of the most valuable lessons I learned through that was that actually you, as a salesperson, you do not control the outcome. You control the process. But you always, salespeople, um, and, and I understand why, we want to claim the outcome. We go, man, that was a great price. Look what we did. Um, but the reality is that you control the process. And so it was a really, it was a big learning curve for me that actually it doesn't matter that I had good processes in place, but actually to derive a sense of satisfaction and a, um, 
a confidence that I had a really robust process that then enabled me to detach a little bit from the outcome because it was really tough. Like if you're, if you're with someone, uh, I remember leading into that, the big thing with the GFC was that the banks were lending huge money, like hundred percent loans. And I had people that I literally sold houses to, they bought a house with 100% finance. There was no deposit. There was no cushion and they were both working. That's how they funded it. And then you get one person that loses the job, man, that makes it pretty tight and pretty hard. And then the other one like has a baby and has to, you know, can no longer work and like they're screwed. And so it was actually a really, really unpleasant scenario in some situations. And that was hard psychologically as a salesperson because you really care about your clients. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the thing that I guess um, that, this to me, when you look at um, potentially talking about prices and what might happen, uh, I, I think it's the risky part is to, to think, oh yeah, man, prices are going to come back because even with that market, they didn't come back that far. They really didn't. There was like, there was a contraction in pricing, but not massive. The biggest contraction was in volume. And that's why I say, I can say with some experience that when there's huge uncertainty or there is downward pressure on pricing, volume of sales drops because people hate to lose money. And I watched it firsthand. Even though they wanted to move, the real challenge was helping people to connect the dots of what they actually wanted to achieve. And if you could help someone to connect the dots of what they wanted to achieve, they would take a hit so they could take the, the advantage on the other side and you can still transact. But it was, it was, it was challenging. Um, and I think that when there's uncertainty and we just don't know what happens, that reminds me a huge amount of um, the election years that I've seen. Uh, and even the, um, even the foreign owner ban, like the uncertainty that these things create, generally speaking, actually sees people not act. And that's why I feel like the opportunities to do something, because when everyone else is not doing something, that's when their opportunities exist. So like most recent thing was the foreign owners um, change in rules. And so at the time I was managing the Greenland branch and all my guys, they saw it as a massive opportunity because they're like, they believed with some certainty that 20% of the market was going to disappear. So they went hard talking to all their clients and saying, Hey, now's the time you've got to get to the market. So we saw a massive boom in the number of listings that came on the market because salespeople had confidence. So we're not talking about uncertainty here. We're talking about the opposite. There was almost like such confidence in the salespeople and therefore on the owners that they had to be on the market to, to make the most of the flurry of buyers. But guess what? The opposite happens. Yes, we had a huge new lot of listings that came in, but fundamentally, the number of foreign um, sales that were made through that time, yeah, sure, there were a couple of examples. But the local buyers were like, well, this is, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we'll just wait. And they will just wait it. And then there was a massive surge in activity and prices on the other side of it. So the same thing happens in election years. And I feel like the same thing's happening with this. Like it's so uncertain at the moment that right now, because of that huge level of uncertainty, massive contraction and people actually doing anything, but then out the other side of it, like the, what are the three biggest drivers? Um, the three D's in real estate, death, divorce, debt. I mean, all these things, you, you put people who are already on the rocks in a, in a um, confined situation for a month, see how that goes. Um, and the debt side of things, you know, really when you talk about kicking the can down the road, uh, this is just actually more debt. Um, so I don't know, I feel like there's gonna be pr plenty of increased need to sell, but also there's gonna be a flurry of activity once people kind of get their heads around where things are at and actually they start to take, um, take action. But yeah, it's just unknown. If the, if the prices start to fall, I don't think they'll fall far, but it will cause a reduction in actual volume of sales. That's my pick anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, there's so, so much wisdom that I could, I could um, connect connect with what you with what you just mentioned like yeah i mean uh, as a salesperson uh we we are only controlling the process not not the outcome you know it's it always feels good to aim for like certain amount of uh volume but all we can do is go hey look you know today we we go for the 20 calls you know we make we'll make our calls we we'll make our calls <laughs> we do our meetings like that's that's the only thing we can control and right now it's, it's the same and and you know we've got the quantity which is which is the volume and then you just gotta you just gotta constantly have a process to to inc improve the quality as well you know like a like a monthly review or some sort um but right now it's you know you're gonna see the conversion rate being lower so you, you just gotta try and target 
I guess, trying to find the right pool of people to talk to, like, mm. you know, be really specific of, of who you're looking for, because volumes are definitely going to, like, we feel it. Um, I, I certainly feel pretty bad with, like, I had, I had, um, just before the lockdown, I had three, three, um, con uh, three sales under contract. I know that those would have gone through, like, normally, if it mm. wasn't for the lockdown, but they all pulled out, and it was the right thing, right? Like, uh, for them, it's, it's uncertain. They they rather just maybe hold on to their cash, not not commit to anything. Like, because it it would be wrong for me to tell them, hey, I know what's going to happen. Like, you'll be fine. Yeah, like, I'm not going to say that, right? I'd rather them to be in a in a in a more cons take, take the more conservative approach. Like, that's that's me trying to like that. That's me maturing as an advisor as well. Is yes. that in the beginning, like everybody that comes to me is like, hey, bank can't lend me. Um, uh, 600k can you get me 600k you know it's just trying to like constantly the the best thing that people want is extend my lending to to as much as possible but um it's yeah like as as i mature like it's me asking them hey have you thought about what is your backup plan you know what where's the cash flow coming from um what is your how have you learned this one, right what if the what if the renters that stop paying you know it's just trying to look at the more conservative approach. And, and I think, yeah, like doing nothing for majority of like some portion of the market, they shouldn't be doing anything. But yeah, I think a good portion of it who have- And let's, can we talk about that briefly? Because, uh, yeah. you know, I I mean, I'm maybe I'm slightly bullish in my approach. So I think it's really good to have the, um, the other side of this. What are some of the factors that are, uh, warning signs for you with your experience and you talk about that maturity what have you learned what do you look for what do you what would your advice be for people to kind of self-identify whether they need to be quite cautious yeah i look um me naturally i'm a i'm an optimist like mm. i see the positive and things i see i i see less of the downside i see okay how like where's the opportunity in this more than any like any anything and so it's very natural for me to just go, yeah, no, I can, I can do that. But at the same time, like I know then what is, what is important is actually what are the 10, 10 worst thing that can happen? Just trying to think through those and being able to have a plan in place. You know, I, I talked to one of my mentors who is an accountant. Um, he's a, he's a, like a more experienced accountant, like pretty established firm, right? Uh, runs he's, he's one of the directors and when I catch up with him like every time I tell him my plan he will ask me what is the plan what is your ex, uh, like plan a like backup plan a and then okay okay you got your backup plan a what's the backup plan b okay what's the backup backup plan c right he's trying to get me to think about give me like I, I like your plan tell me the three exit plans or the or three exit strategy or three um three ways that you're going to make sure that you know this is uh if if it goes south how are you gonna how, how do you how do you plan to face the situation and i think that's the same for for us in, as an advisor is just trying to you know sometimes the client have thought through those like hmm. um you know just very, really simple right vacancy rate vacancy rate is a lot of beginners investors they don't think about that they always think it's 100 percent vacancy Oh, sorry, 100 occupancy. Mm. And, um, you know, that the property is never going to be trashed, like all tenants are, are good. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like, they, yeah, it's just trying to think about like, okay, who do, you, and I guess the easiest way to solve it is, is to have the right team of advisors around you, you know, mm. having a real estate agent, um, having the property manager, having, having an accountant, having the lawyer, like, just the right team around you is going to is going to solve 80 to 80 percent of that um sort of like i guess the downside of it covering the downside because your advisors are going to ask you the downside mm. i guess the challenging piece is you have to know enough to know if your advisor is giving you good advice yeah yeah Def yeah that definitely i think that's that's important and yeah it's it's really hard in the industry i mean um you know i, I hate to say this but you know like real estate agent and financial even financial advisors you don't really need that much qualification to get yeah. into 
So it's so like even in the industries that you do need a lot of qualification, like let's talk accountants and I'm not having a go. I'm just saying like, you've got to study hard for that. But man, I've had a few different accountants and the, 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 the spread and creative ability and knowledge and even just the way they communicate massive yeah and 100 percent like even if there's qualification that's 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 the interesting thing about these this the consulting world is like especially for our service like real estate agent and and uh, financial advisor because essentially we're working for free uh and it's we're working on success, succession fee and so you can pay for you, you don't have to pay anything um different to work with one of the best in the industry and and one of the you know like the newer people in the industry it's like yeah it's just just interesting how yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right the that's so true it's so true and what are what are the questions that um that someone should be asking to try and figure out if they're working with the right you know professional advisor yeah i, I think trying to first of all understand like why they're doing what they're doing Mm. you know like is there some connection like that you can relate yeah some kind of higher purpose rather than just chasing the dollar yeah i mean for me it is i mean maybe there are tons of professionals that just do it for the sake of doing it but for me i think i think just being able to connect with that person and go yeah like um there are some elements that i can s- sort of connect to i think that's that's important because you know their why and that's that's gonna okay, yep, I, I like that story. And then now give me a little bit about your, your process of how you, how you make decision, right? Um, to help me understand how you make your decision on how you advise, you know, those, those kind of things, like it's, it's quite important. Um, and then, you know, it's, having testimonials is, is important now, you know, just, just being able to see how much reviews the, the, the advisor might have um client case studies those kind of things always always gonna always gonna be good and then just a bit of um yeah a bit of experience i i I don't always i don't always value experience with above everything like i guess it's just seeing like the little things like people doing what they say they're gonna do that's important right if a if i'm dealing with a new advisor then i expect more from them i go okay well if you say you're gonna be on time if you say you're gonna deliver this um then you better deliver on time and if you say like i'd rather someone tell me like actually i don't know that but what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna find out from my senior senior person in my company or i'm gonna find out from these senior people you know just being able to utilize those resource that that builds a lot of trust right Mm -hmm. and i'd rather work with someone that is willing to go hey i don't know but i'm gonna find out for you yeah, and the opportunity for someone who's in their position of not knowing is actually just using every opportunity like that to take the deep dive because you can get an answer to something and that will fix your question. But you can actually go, well, whoa, hang on a second. Let me try and understand why that is the answer. What, like you said before about, you know, what is the decision-making process? What are the things that affect the decision? Um, I'm just speaking here for advice with someone that's in the mortgage broking industry or a real estate agent that's getting started, or even if they've been around for a while, like I constantly came across weird and curly situations. I'm naturally a curious person. So for me, it was interesting to try and wrap my head around, even if it was a drafting issue, like it's really in the, in the legal uh, side of things, but I'm curious to try and understand it. So I think if you can get curious with that stuff when you're in the industry and, and actually, I, I think there's a huge value. Um, the reason why I value working with you is that you don't just know about how to make a mortgage application and get every last dollar from a bank. You've also got a, a, a wide sphere of broad understanding where whilst you won't give specialist advice, for example, on your tax efficiency, you still know there are opportunities for it. So you can flag the opportunity and say, hey, you should be chatting to your advisor to try and get this because I'm aware there could be a benefit here. And I think the opportunity is there for all of us with that kind of work. If you, you should be a specialist, but at the same token, actually having really good general knowledge allows you to be way more creative and see opportunities that others don't. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. Uh, 
that was a compliment for me, so thank you. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I really, I, I very like, I very much agree with your approach um, with finding the advisors that are not just like, hey, irony, like you know, this is this is the this is where I work. Um, like, because I, I, the the way the way the reason why I would know about other industries, is I I care like just like just like you being curious, trying to find out. Okay, why does a lawyer recommend this? How how does the process work there? Um, and then how what what is the accountant thinking? And uh, you know, I don't just talk to one. I'll talk to like three or four really good ones, try and exchange knowledge. Yeah. Um, and that's really important. Like what kind of team is this person working with? That's, yes. that's really good because they say you're, you're the average five people that you know or hang out with. So yeah, yeah. You know, oh, this could... is a huge point. This is a huge point. So actually you alluded to it before, but I really love the analogy that you're talking about here, building a team. So it doesn't matter how you're approaching this. Actually, who is your, who's your team? You know, if you're a salesperson, Who's the team of people that you actually have around you that are not just your advisors, but that any of your clients can tap into? Um, and I see that it's the same thing working with you. Um, actually, can you give me, well, let's talk specifically real estate salespeople. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you're probably listening to this right now and, uh, and I'm going, right, what's, what, are, what are the ways that I can work best with a mortgage broker? How do I get the best out of it? So if you were talking to someone that's working with you and uh, I see this huge synergy, but what do you, from your side of the fence, what's the best way to get the most out of a relationship with a mortgage broker? Yeah, I think I think I would say um, just understanding what we actually do first. Mm. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. I think majority of the real estate agents don't realize they're like, oh yeah, the, the client just deals can just deal with the bank. Um, and and it, it's it's. Can you just delve a little bit deeper into that? Let's skin it back fundamentally what do you do blandon yeah it's 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 um because it's hard to it's hard to just tell you like i think i think majority of the agents expect you know we get we get the lending we get the lower we get lower interest rate that's that's basically what it is and because that's what they that's what they need hmm. but what the client needs is is something different like it's it's fundamentally something different and and something that the bank can't provide is is being able to look at a broader plan with the client like overall okay like this decision here um how is that going to affect them five years 10 years 15 years down the track how are we setting up this investment properly are we are we doing it properly because the bank don't offer that advice right so uh, fundamentally yes there is the interest rate and then negotiating with different banks to to get the maximum level because what happens is if the client is only dealing with one, one bank um what happens is yes they got their pre-approval it's it's pre-approval of six hundred thousand. but if i got your buyer a hundred thousand or hundred and fifty thousand dollars difference in in purchasing power how is that going to make your job you know like is it going to make your job easier or harder right um, and then you've got um, not not a banker telling them, hey, this is the pre-approval, go out there and do it. Um, but they sit down with an advisor to go, hey, yes, we're going to lend you 150000 extra, but this is how you are going to handle it. You know, people are scared of taking $150,000 extra. So <laughs> we're going to look at the logical side of, of making that work. And they understand it, making sure they understand. And then just looking at the long term as well. And So, so um, tip one, understand what they do <laughs> what, yeah. what, what's the, what's the second point i think secondly is um just co communications communications and um well actually before the communications i think second one is finding the advisor that has similar market as mm -hmm. you because i i, I can't I, I won't say i'm i'm a I'm mortgage advisor for every single agent out there no like some of the transactions and clients that they're dealing with is probably not my not my cup of tea, or, or not I wouldn't say not my cup of tea, but maybe it's just not a not you're a not great fit. The right fit. Yeah, like I yeah. I, I finding, focus finding someone that works in a similar niche, both exactly. both um, geographically and demographically. Yeah, exactly geographically, demographically, and and the value that you're providing. You know, I, I know some agents, they work with mostly developers. I know some agents work with, you know, most, most flippers down south. You know, I know some agents that just sell, you know, like two bedroom units. <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs>
So there's, there's different types of agents and it, there's certainly different types of mortgage advisors as well. So it's, it's not just finding like the best in the area, but understand what kind of clients they're dealing with. Like, you know, I, I yeah, sometimes it's like, what are, I really what appreciate are, the referrals, but you know, yeah. it's not the right client fit, right? Yes. Like, so talk to me about the referrals, because I think this, um, from a salesperson's perspective, the most valuable thing, um, obviously you want a, um, a mortgage advisor who's going to help make deals happen, but at the same token, uh, and look after the clients really well, but at the same token, you're also hoping for the kickbacks to come the other way. Yeah. What, what tips do you get for, for getting referrals? Yeah, I, I think a lot of real estate agents that... You know, I, I try to think back who I refer a business to is one that adds more value than just like, hey, if you want your house sold, list with me, right? Like I'm, I'm looking for an agent that is specializing in something as well. Like, you know, they, 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 they care about something. They, they're more passionate about certain things about uh, real estate. You know, I think, yeah, you know, like whether or not they're dealing with a uh, portfolio investors, whether or not they're dealing with overseas investors, you know, they have their niche as well. And, and being able to say, Hey, look, I'm dealing with this market. You're dealing with this market. This is the value I'm providing. This is my process. Um, so this, and just, this is a huge point. So for you to actually, like you're identifying that people that you sent referrals to is because they have been um, deliberate in their approach to actually specialize so you and and in such a way that their brand to you is that they're a specialist in this particular area or they're a specialist in this particular type of property or they're a specialist working with this particular type of client and so when you meet someone that comes through that matches oh they're in that area so i'm going to send to that salesperson or oh they're this they've got a property that this guy seems to sell a lot of and he does a great job and so that's actually flagging so a real important point here for you is um how do you be deliberate in your strategy to create a point, not just of difference, but of speciality that is then able to help connect the dots for people to send you referrals? Yeah, like, I mean, if you go, hey, I'm a, I'm a real estate agent specializing in Glen Eden. Well, how do, you, how do you actually turn that into, translate that into case study that people can read up? Your, your mortgage brokers or your accountants and your, your lawyer can actually go, oh, I see how this is valuable for my client. Well, a real simple thing that springs to my mind, and some of my clients do this really well, is they actually give great insight regularly into that local marketplace. So they're connected in the marketplace, they're active in the community, and they're knowledgeable in it and distributing that knowledge. But they're, they're not just sending it to the people that live there, they're sending it to you. <laughs> and so you yeah, go, exactly. oh, I always see his updates on Glen Eden. He knows what he's talking about. Plus he's always got listings in there. And oh, I saw him doing that event with them in Glen Eden. And so you start to remember it. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, like uh, we're not, um, uh, like we, we got a decent portfolio of clients, right? It's like, you know, after five years, we're, we're sort of sitting at around 1300 and, you know, a lot of clients sell their houses, you know, so it's just, it's, and I think it's important to try and connect with those professions. Have you identified what kind of churn there is in your client base? Uh, what kind of churn? When I say churn, um, like annual turnover of properties per client. Oh, that's, that's hard to say, but I, I would say, um, yeah, like there, there are, there are clients selling, you know, I mean, well, what is one what is one sale worth to an agent quite a bit so like yeah you don't you don't need too many sales right like if you if you oh. can connect with some advisors totally totally yeah. i mean yeah the well, only reason i ask is i'm interested to know what and because largely sorry I, correct me if i'm wrong but you to me talk about that branding that specialization uh, i feel like you're particularly valuable to an investor yeah, I know you can deal with all sorts of others, but I feel like that's a niche that you guys have really carved out well. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a little bit. I, I wouldn't say uh, super geek, but I like, I like spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and accountants, from the sounds of things, as well. <laughs> yeah, um, I like, I like to spreadsheet stuff, and then you know, like 
a lot of ratios. I look at ratios and yeah, well, this is so like, here you go, get curious on it. I'd love to know because I always dive deep into an area. Like if I'm coaching a salesperson and we're using an area strategy, which I think is a smart way to go, by the way, uh, then it's a case of, well, let's actually work out what what's the value if you're connected to, and you, you said, was it 1,700 or 1,300 clients? 1,300, yeah. For a salesperson to be viable, you can actually thrive on an even smaller number than that. But let's just say a thousand, right? Well, if you actually were connected to a thousand people in a meaningful way in this area, then you can work out what the annual turnover is. And I don't know Glenn Edens, but I've done a whole lot of different analysis. And typically I'd see over a 10 year period, an annual turnover of like five and a half percent. And so I was curious to know if in an investor list, whether that number is markedly higher. I know, um, uh, rental portfolios i've got figures but i thought i'd just see see what it is from, from your perspective so you know I, I definitely agree with that um 1000 true friend f- uh, theory um you know if you can if you can be top of mind for one thing for a thousand people and they not just top of mind but they they know who you are you know and and they say if they spend uh, I, I believe it was um seven hours if they if you can get in front of them for seven hours, they have, they have come to know you. Like it doesn't matter if you're seven hours in front of them, seven hours digitally is the same. So if you can, if you have enough content of seven hours, they know who you are. You know, they, they're like, oh yeah, I know David Palfreyman. I, I, but I've only seen seven hours of videos of David Palfreyman. <laughs> well, they only have to watch this one live stream and they're going to be halfway there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, I think we, um, we're making it a little bit too long, eh? Maybe, maybe. I, I, honestly, like so, I, so much, so much good stuff. Yeah, I, I genuinely feel like um, it's not about the length of the video, and people are probably uh, joining us in this particular moment rather than having watched from the start. But the most important thing is the content. You know, like if 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 what you and I are talking about is interesting, it's interesting to me. There's going oh, to be it's interesting to me. Uh, like, <laughs> so hey we're, we're we're enjoying this we're connecting our little bubbles virtually and having a bloody good yarn it's absolutely <laughs> outstanding um but then just very quickly wrap up for me maybe with just some of the opportunities that you see in the coming months both what you can do now let's, let's give, give us a quick sting on not just um mortgage brokers or um real estate sales people but just business in general like what is the opportunity right now like how to spend your time effectively and then what are the opportunities in the coming months from your perspective uh for real estate market right uh, mate, i'm intrigued just to know from your perspective like you're sitting across a lot of different markets uh, what what sits across those what are the opportunities right now i think from in terms of um for from a business perspective for real estate agents um for mortgage advisors like this is this is a time to plan this is a time to plan like you 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 have a bit more time on your hand to go okay actually what has worked really well like you got to try and look at the 80 20 list you know you got to list out how have you been spending your time how could you change your process to be more efficient and so when the when the wave come you can you can double up you can yeah. you can go twice as fast this is a time to sit down and go okay well actually which day am i going to block out um and i'm going to look at process i'm going to i'm going to read books i'm going to watch videos i'm going to look at tutorials how do people actually what are the top agents doing differently than i am even if you're a top agent like okay how do i get more time for my family yeah. how do i how do i delegate what i what i can delegate and then just really sp- like, you know, always, always tell the team to keep the calls up, just making sure, keep in touch, keep in contact. Um, that's the most important thing is the, is the basic thing that has not changed ever in our industry is, is the phone calls. Oh, right? and mate, just, you know what the great thing about this time is you can't catch COVID-19 on the phone. <laughs> uh, and, and people are more likely to pick up their phones. Totally, mate. Well, hey, we're we're sitting here Saturday morning and having a bloody good yarn. Uh, we might not get to do this normally. Yeah. So, so keeping in touch with the database, I think it's um it's so important. But the opportunity is, um, being able to slow down to set it up so that you can you can face the the way. I, I believe there's going to be an up 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 market coming soon. So you just got to make sure you're ready for that and. Uh, we we're ready like we're going to make sure our process is right so that you know we can 
hire advisors and train them up quickly when when there's more volume. Um, but so yeah, if I just summarize quickly some of those things. So actually, now like let's work with the season, and actually this is the season for getting your plan, getting the business structure, getting your processes honed. This is the season for staying in touch with people, for connecting and maintaining the relationships you already have. Yeah. And it's the season for being prepared for the uptick that's that's coming. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, if you're in a position um, to acquire, this is the perfect time, right? You know, if, if you've got, if you got equity in your in your property, you know, New Zealand, like I mentioned before, Air New Zealand's at lower than a dollar. You know, if you've got some money sitting on the side of equity, you can top up a little bit. Just go, you know, just take a punt on Air New Zealand. Or even if you if you could pick up some properties, um, I guess you know there there's a lot of subdividable. Like I, that's something I I pay attention to. Um, subdividable properties, um, cash flow positive property in the region. Region is going to obviously take take a bigger hit. So, Would it be okay to ask what, what you're doing at the moment? Are you buying in New Zealand shares, or are you looking at subdividable properties? What, what's your situation? I'm, I'm biased, man. I'm I'm prop, I'm property pro. So <laughs> yeah, made made a couple of offers in this current market. <laughs> Why have you? Yeah, put a couple of offers on and see um, see what sticks, and then. You got you got a bit more time to do due, due diligence due, due to go COVID nineteen, yeah. especially for you know someone who who wants to develop properties. You know they they've got more time to get their planners and architect to do some drawings. Um, I, I think the regional property, the cash flow stuff. I mean, you look if if anyone listen listening knows Graham Fowler, you know the guy with like one hundred and fifty properties or something in Hastings. You know, yeah, there's a lot of cash flow properties out there that's good right now it's going to be on a lower lower price i've got a couple of clients buying in invercargo at the moment settling 10 plus percent cash flow right those are good opportunities and then for business wise i think you know um are there real estate agents that could that might be giving up you know just stay in touch farm their database <laughs> i don't know like yeah, yeah, no. I was just curious about your, you literally, uh, and, you, and you answered it. You know, you put in a couple of offers. Uh, what have you done um, structurally in the offer? So, uh, has your approach been different due to the circumstances? I think still looking at numbers, um, but yeah, like just trying to get the agent to understand. You know, like at the moment, everyone's uncertain. I think um, it's it's like I'm I'm like expect an offer from me that's going to be you know, 5% below at least, or five ten percent below of what, what, um, what the normal market might expect. But obviously I, I'm doing my, like my, my figure is based on numbers. And then the agent's figure is based on um, market value and what they can get for the vendor. So, yeah. So if, if there's a, if there's a deal that works with the numbers for the investor side, and then you could get it below market value, that's that's a huge plus for investors totally um and what what conditions are you putting in your office uh yeah i mean i'm on the just the basic stuff due diligence <laughs> uh yeah after lockdown is um finished yeah and then as i mean for for me i personally would look at longer settlement dates uh, agents not going to like to hear this but obviously longer settlement dates because there's a bit of uncertainty and um, different focuses immediately than trying to sort out like finances and sell a property like in the next coming months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, no, I just don't see urgency to try and settle property right now. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how <laughs> others are behaving as well, but I suspect you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, 100%. yeah. Mate, you're an absolute champion. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thanks for that was, that was good fun. No, nice, man. Definitely enjoyed it, eh? Definitely enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure there's, there's so much gold that, that's um, been covered. So that's good, man. Well, good luck buying a property, mate. Let, let, let me I'll know. Let you know. I'll let you know. <laughs> Sounds good. Look forward to catching up with you again soon, Blandon. Okay, Cheers, mate. Soon, David. See ya. Yeah.